Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. It's so great to see you again. I'm so happy to see so many of you returning for our weekly MIT Center for International Studies and True Africa University webinar, where we explore issues related to Africa's sustainable development. And it's great that you're joining us. It's, you know, it's been really interesting because we this, this season, this year, we've had a really interesting mix of um, uh, guest uh, speakers from different parts of Africa, but we've also had a really interesting gender mix. Uh, it, last year was a little bit more male. This this year is a little bit more balanced. But you know, we have a very very special guest this week, and her name is Marie Cécile Zansou. She is French Beninese. Um, as you might have read in the bio, she is the founder and president and artistic director of the Fondation Zansou in Benin in Cotonou. But you know she's doing a lot of other things to promote contemporary art from Africa all over the world. She's um, very humble, but she's also you know created so many programs that are really all about educating the youth through the arts and what I'll just call uh, getting them into an on ramp into the creative industries. So she's got a really big vision. Uh, one of the things that people don't know about her in the United States is that last year President Macron of France actually appointed her as the president of the French Academy in Rome, the Villa Medici, which is one of the most beautiful buildings in Rome that have been, you know, kind of promoting generation after generation of artists. So she's totally transcultural in the way that I am. And it's great that she can share with us a lot about how she feels um, uh, about Africa becoming a cultural force. So I, I wrote it as a question, but I think you all know that the answer is yes, Africa is becoming a cultural force. So as usual, I wanna thank everybody at the MIT Center for International Studies, True Africa University, all of our partners, and I will give the floor to Marie Cecile who will present a few slides before we get into the Q&A session. Marie Cecile, welcome. Hello, Claude. Thank you so much for, uh, for inviting me here. Um, I wanted to share with you um, uh, a, few, a few images of my experience in the 17 last years. Um, as you said, the foundation Zinsu has been created uh, in 2005, and we opened the first museum that you see in front of you, um, uh, the first museum of contemporary art uh, on the continent in 2013. So um, what have we done during the 17 last years? Um, and first, why did we start this adventure? Um, when I, I decided to live in Benin in 2003, my father is from Benin and my mother is from France. I had been raised in France and I decided to come back uh, to Benin in 2003. And I started teaching with uh, young children in um, uh, an art school. Um, there are very, very few art school in the region, but uh, this one um, needed an art school art uh, history professor. So I tried, uh, I started that um, uh, in 2003. And I realized that all my students um, uh, were exceptionally uh, interested by the art history, but had absolutely no ways uh, of accessing it. Uh, no books, they had no nothing that, you know, no books, no films, no, and no museums. Uh, six colonial museums in Benin, uh, and none of them uh, in which you could see contemporary creations. So as I used to visit museums everywhere in New York, in Paris, in London, in Germany, in Japan, I felt that our creation from the continent was shown everywhere and that we needed absolutely to show it on the continent. So um, I did this thing maybe um, opposite to most people. I started uh, the museum and the foundation before making the fortune which goes with it. So I decided to open this, uh, this space because I wanted a place where African artists from all over Africa could come and exhibit. And I wanted the public to be able to see um, uh, the contemporary creation. So we started and um, it was at the beginning, the first week was a bit special because uh, we started with a solo show by Romuald Azoumé. Some of you might have uh, heard about him. Um, he's now uh, represented by Gagosian in, uh, in New York and is one of the most important artists of Western Africa. And we showed his work, but people had absolutely no idea uh, of why they would come uh, to see us because there was 
no museums in Cotonou, no structures to show art. So people came in the building and then went out saying, I think there's nothing here. And we had to explain uh, why we were here and what we wanted to, to do um, uh, showing this work. And very, very quickly, uh, people understood and the children came. And that was um, maybe explain uh, the number you have 7 million visitors. Um, people came, uh, children came after school. Uh, they came and visited and they realized it was really fun and really interesting. And uh, then we called the schools to say, we have so many children at uh, five o'clock when uh, school is finished. Can you please organize and come with us because it's uh, help us to, to deal with the children because we had like no one during the day. And then after school, 1000 children came at the same time. So um, we did, decided to do a mediation very specific on children and we decided to, to open. Maybe if we see the next slide, um, you can have an idea of, uh, yeah. So the so slide uh, with the Brûli Boisbré and the children is the opening of, uh, of the museum in Ouida. After having organized uh, exhibitions uh, in Cotonou for uh, seven years, we decided to open a museum because people were asking for it. And we had a space, we had an art space, but people were asking us, why don't you, why don't you have a museum like in every other country in the world? <coughs> Sorry. And we had this uh, collection that had been created through the years because every time we did an exhibition, we produced works and um, we bought some works because the artists needed to have collectors on the continent. And so um, having this collection, we needed to show it. We couldn't just keep it uh, in, a, in a stock somewhere. It was, uh, it was not useful. So we decided to open the WIDA Museum that you can see uh, here with a few uh, exhibitions. Uh, um, we did, and we started the residency program. Uh, after three years, um, uh, we started inviting artists and producing on the continent, which was, which seems to me very important um, because Benin is such an inspiring country, and uh, and it's not on the art map, so people don't feel the pressure of the art world coming to Ida. They are free and. So they create uh, in a much more important way than they could create elsewhere um, because they, they just know that they will meet their public and the public will just be very open to their message. There is no snobism or it's not an elitist uh, uh, public. It's like people who come and they want to understand and they admire you. And so you don't feel the pressure of the art press and of the, of the small world of uh, contemporary art. On the next slide, if we can see it, yeah. Um, you have another project, which is called the Experimental Garden, um, which is very close by the museum, uh, which is uh, something we're doing right now and uh, we're working on because we have very different space um, uh, in, the, in the country, in Benin. Um, this one is interesting because most of the artists stopped by and decided to build uh, an outside project. And that is very, um, uh, it's, it explains explains the way we work. We ask people to come to us, but we also go to them. And um, this garden is on a road between Benin and Togo, and it's a very frequented road, and a lot of people are coming through. And so we, we stopped there and we decided to have artistic project there because it's a, it's a very natural stop for people and uh, people can discover uh, artworks in a very different context. And we've been doing that a lot also. We've been doing um, uh, exhibition outside our walls. So uh, since the beginning, uh, we create exhibition mostly with photography, um, going to see people and uh, introduce us to say okay this is what we we want you to show you and uh, this is um, you should come to see us in the museums and so on the third slide uh, you'll see um, the Cotonou uh, lab which is we used to have a very big building in Cotonou and after Covid we changed 
we decided to create more projects in Ouida and have a very small space in Cotonou because the public was asking us. We had closed and people came to us saying, you can't close uh, the place in the capital city. We need to come and uh, going to Ouida, it's 36 kilometers, but it's, uh, it's a travel. So people asked us to open a new space in Cotonou. So we decided to open the lab. So today we have three spaces. We have the garden, the Cotonou Lab, and the Wida Museum. Um, uh, we have created 42 exhibitions. We've been doing books. Um, some of them, you can find them on our website because we're trying to share as much as we can. So on our website, you can um, freely charge our books and, uh, and uh, read them anywhere. So we've been trying to touch um, everyone as far as we can, uh, as far as we can go. Um, then on the next slide, I think you'll see, yes, this is kind of our reality. Um, here you have the Kiss Hiring Show and uh, our cultural bus. And this is exactly what it looks like if you come uh, to our museum. The first slide is, uh, is a show we did um, uh, with a private collector who had decided that he should show Basquiat on the continent. And we did uh, the first Basquiat, Jean-Michel Basquiat show on the continent. And people were so um, uh, interested and happy about it that the collector decided to lend us also a Kiss Haring show. And we did the Kiss Haring mask show, uh, which is a rare form that not everyone knows. And in Benin, it was also a huge success. So here you can see the children coming after school and uh, visiting. And then you can see one of our initiative, which was the cultural bus. It's an American school bus that we've been offered and that is coming um, uh, once, twice or three times a day uh, with children. He, he goes to schools and he picks the children for free and he brings them back because we are in one of the 20 poorest countries in the world. So even if everything we do is free, it's a difficult, uh, it's a budget to, to come and uh, just to pay for the transport of the kids is complicated. So we have this bus who goes and uh, travels uh, through the country, through the south of, the, of Benin to go and pick up school uh, who were asking uh, for, for it. So children can come and visit. And that's how we have uh, almost 300 partnerships with, uh, with different schools. So I think that's, about the story of the foundation in a short way. Uh, I'm trying to be short because Claude has asked me to, to explain and try to open a bit the subject. So if we go through the next slide, um, maybe the next one, these are a few exhibitions we did. Yes, um, this opens an, uh, on one interesting thing to, to speak about your subject about as, uh, is Africa becoming a cultural force? Um, I was thinking about your subject and the provocation of your question. And um, it gave me a few ideas on what happened uh, in the last 20 years. When I started the foundation in 2005, uh, the continent uh, had very, very few uh, places, uh, art spaces. Um, we had the Biennale of Dakar and the Biennale of Bamako, but um, there were so, such few initiatives. And finally, everything has changed in 15, 20 years. And the first thing um, I was thinking uh, was what really changed is the way uh, we look at ourselves. Uh, and maybe this is one of the most fundamental um, revolution that has happened uh, in Western Africa um, uh, recently. The way we, we've been taught uh, that we were inferior people, um, that which started with slavery and continued with colonization, the effect of this history made us think uh, we were inferior people. And Actually, still today, it's a very difficult question. And in Benin, it's something you feel um, almost all the time. And why, why do we see this picture? Um, this picture is uh, on the left, you have an 1895 photo. And on the right, you have a 2022 photo. Um, the difference is 5,000 kilometers. In 1895, we had just been colonized. Um, uh, we, when I say we, I mean Benin, uh, we had been shared in the Berlin conference, uh, so we had become French, 
1895, uh, the objects of the royal court of Abomey, the capital of the, um, of the kingdom of Daomey, uh, had been robbed. And uh, what you see on your left are the looted objects that were in uh, Paris, in the Trocadero Museum, um, shown uh, to explain uh, who were the colonized uh, countries. On the right, you have those same two, two sculptures, which are in Benin, as if arrived in February. And um, this is what we call restitution. What has changed is that we used to think we were inferiors, and now we start thinking again uh, that maybe, uh, maybe people have not told the truth. And with just our actual government, five years ago, asked France to give back the looted objects. And what could seem totally impossible because French law doesn't uh, authorize uh, the restitution of uh, works that are in the French national collection, what seems impossible uh, has become possible. So President Macron uh, in France has decided that um, Africa couldn't be uh, separated from her heritage. And he decided to change the law and this two, those two sculptures you see are uh, part of the 26 uh, important objects of the royal uh, treasure uh, that, is, that have come back to Benin. It's been five years of, uh, of advocacy, five years of uh, almost fight, but um, today uh, we can see uh, our history back at home. And this is something that maybe we'll uh, speak about uh, a bit later, but it's very representative of what's happening um, uh, today in, uh, in Western Africa. And we start the new generation, not the one who has been uh, raised during uh, colonization, who, uh, who has come just after uh, independence, but the new generation is starting to question what we've been taught for for the last uh, 450 years or 500 years and people are starting thinking that maybe um, we can look at ourselves before looking at others um, uh, to to understand the world that is around us claude i don't know if you <laughs> want us to to do a conversation now or if i should uh, continue a little I think you should continue a little bit because this is fascinating. <laughs> okay, so I'll I'll just tell you about um, uh, I'll stay in my art uh, in my art world, but um, I'll tell you a few things that um, we're thinking about now. Um, if we take the history of museums, everyone knows that museums have been created, um, France and England will fight, but either in France or in England, the Ashmolean or the Louvre are the oldest museums in the world. But then this is what we've been taught. But then what happened in Western Africa? Maybe we can think a minute about what, what happened there. We, didn't, we did not, sorry, create the museums. That's for sure. But uh, what happened in the 18th and 19th century is very interesting because most of the treasures uh, of the palace were shown to the population in Daomey. Every year, at the end of the year, you had uh, ceremonies called the Huetanu, and during the Huetanu, you had uh, the most impressive uh, objects and uh, artworks of the palace that would go through the population and would be shown to everyone to show the power of the king, which is something very, very um, common to some to a castle like Versailles or where the king would use arts to show his power. But we had never been, we had never realized that we did exactly the same and that we showed art. And when the restitution question arrived on the table, people said, but Africa doesn't care about heritage and you don't know how to preserve this heritage. But actually the answer was there all the time. It's just that it, is, it had been hidden and we had forgot, forgotten. We used to preserve our heritage. We used to preserve the artwork and we used to show them, not in the way uh, the Occidental world has chosen, but actually um, it's uh, something we used to do and that is totally in our tradition. And that's why when the, coloni when the colonization soldiers arrived in Abomey, they found treasures that 
the treasures, sorry, that had like one century or two centuries, it's because it was absolutely fundamental in our culture to preserve our heritage. But this is something we didn't know. It's very common to something you'll probably have heard, uh, which is uh, the orality, that Africa is not writing our history, um, that we have this tradition to tell our stories uh, under the mango trees, and then that uh, the story disappear because we don't write it. But this is something exactly like museum and like restitution process. We have always been a civiliz civilization of uh, writing. We have written for the last 5,000 years. And the most important university in the world during the 14th century was in Tombouctou. <coughs> Everything was written in Tombouctou and the students were coming from everywhere around. So everyone wrote and uh, knew that. But the colonization history told us we didn't know how to write and that we only spoke and that we were just, uh, that's why our history did never remain and that we were relying on the colonial troops to tell our history. And I think all those changes, I'm thinking about a very uh, basic thing also, and that will be my third example, I'll stop there, um, our names. Uh, you'll realize that uh, today you have two persons, one from Togo, one from Benin, and our names are Claude and Marie-Cécile, which are Christian French names, which is quite weird as we come from Western Africa. But for example, my grandfather has a Christian name, my father, of course, my grandfather, my great-grandfather has a Christian French name. Both of my children have Yoruba names. Both of my children are called Ayodele and Olabisi. Um, it's something we used to have a traditional name because we don't forget who we are, but we used to put it in the second or third position um, and we would never use them. Today, we put them back because that's who we are. And now it's a kind of, it's, we have to be proud of it. It's not a second name, it's just our names. And it's something that we realize today, I see, most of my son's friends have uh, Yoruba names or local names, or it's something that is happening now. And that's why I'm telling you um, the way we look at ourselves is changing. There are so many things to say about the subject. I, I did another slide, um, maybe not the next one, but the second, oh, yes, this one, I'm sorry, <laughs> the, one, the one before. Yeah. Um, I wanted to show you this one um, about how we have changed our way to look at us. Because you have a picture of Joël André Anoma Arisoa and David Adjaye visiting the pavilion of Joël in the Venice Biennale. And the right, you have Maureen Aite, who is the girl who has created Nana Wax, um, uh, one of the most important uh, fashion uh, group in uh, Western Africa. Those three people are visiting the Madagascar Pavilion, which is just next to the Ghanaian Pavilion. And it's very interesting to, you have a few photos of the Ghanaian Pavilion um, uh, lower on the, on the slide. It's very interesting to see that now we are able to project ourselves. And the Venice Biennale um, was very interesting for that. It's the way we want to show ourselves to the world. We used to have no African pavilion there. Um, no, no, well, almost no countries would show uh, their work. Today, uh, we have a few countries that show themselves as the best of the best. When you see the statistic, economic statistics about uh, Ghana or Benin, you could not really think we are the most important countries in the world. But when you see our pavilion in the Venice Biennale, there you realize how important we are. And maybe I'll, I'll finish on that note. Well, that's um, a, a great note to finish on, I have to say, because I remember we were together at the Venice Biennale in 2019. That was already three years ago. And the Venice Biennale is actually starting, I, can, I think it's this weekend or next, yeah. next, ne next week. And, but uh, you know, I really want to take it back to contemporary art. And I want to frame our conversation very differently from the one that I framed with Turiel Glavi, the founder of 54 Art Fair last year when we had this very same webinar exactly a year ago. Um, Turiel was very much talking about 
154 as an art fair and the market for contemporary art in Africa. And basically, it's a lot of rich collectors who are buying African art because they love it. And some of them are speculating. And it's really much more driven by money. And one of the things that I always love about your approach with the museum is the very kind of democratic uh, nature of it and the, the, the inclusive nature of it. And I want to quote a sentence that I found on the internet from one of your interviews. Uh, and, and you had said something that, that, I, that I want you to maybe help us unpack. You said, um, the Fondation Zinsu was created to make a space for dialogue between artists and the public. I was working with children and I wanted them to find out about their culture and try to give them an idea of the time we're living in. So I guess my question and how I want you to unpack it is looking at the past, present and future. You know, the museum is um, an important institution because it allows us to learn about our past, but it can also, through creativity, help us to imagine a future where we are participants and creators of our future. So in the work that you do with the children, how do you educate them about the past and spark their creativity about the future? <coughs> One of the things that the thing shocked me the most when I arrived in, uh, in Benin was the education program. And actually, it still shocks me today um, uh, for the youngest and also uh, for, the, um, uh, for the university. In the university department of uh, history, you have the pre-colonization history, colonization history, post-colonization history for 68 years our history totally depends on colonization, which is totally crazy. And actually you find it with the youngest because they learn about the French history and they still uh, learn about the French kings when they actually don't know the Daomian ones and none of the other kingdoms. So, um, and education is quite strict. Uh, not in a very good way, you know, it's like you really have to learn by heart. You have to do exactly what the teacher tells you. and. So what does the museum provide today? It's a free space. And that is why the Keith Haring exhibition was so important. Some people told, told us at the end of the visit, we don't really like Keith Haring's work, uh, but we love uh, Keith Haring, which is very weird actually. If you see an exhibition of someone who you don't <laughs> like the paintings, it's, it seems very weird to have loved the exhibition. But actually it was an exhibition of Keith Haring's work and his word, and his word was, it was from his journal that he wrote uh, before he was uh, famous. And in 1977, 77, sorry, he wrote that when you see one of his work, uh, your uh, ideas on his work means exactly the same as his ideas. I mean, when you see the work, um, you have, you're as right as he could be, uh, when he painted it and the intention he put inside doesn't really matter. Finally, it's the way you feel that uh, is important. And we wrote that. We put it on the walls next to the paintings. And actually, people were very, very touched. And there you realize how the, the museum is a place where you can dialogue freely. You can ask questions. You can also give answers. And none of them are wrong. And that was what, what was interesting in this uh, exhibition. And this is exactly what I wanted to do with my museum. I wanted to provide a space where everyone could speak about every subject. Uh, we never um, censored any uh, content. Uh, when we did the Kisaring show, he spoke about um, subjects that can, can feel very shocking in Benin. We are now showing Aisha Snusi, who is a very important Tunisian artist, a very young artist, who created a queer civil civilization. In Benin, homosexuality is not um, uh, condemned by death penalty, but in Nigeria, you can have, uh, you can be in jail for, I don't know, 14 or 18 years uh, if somebody thinks you're homosexual. So in, in Ghana you, as well, the laws are changing on that topic. Yeah, in Ghana. Yeah, I, in most countries, I think in 34 countries, uh, it's illegal in, Af in uh, Africa, in 54, it's a lot. So, but museum is a place where you can speak about every subject. You can speak um, around this question of uh, gender and you can speak about the time, you can speak about development, you can speak about politics. It's the free place. That's why it was so important for me to create a museum. And 
the museum it's one thing we talked about before uh, before uh, today it's where do we build museum and why do we build museum we never build museum actually for the history we never uh, think about the past when we build museum we build museum for the future and what is interesting is that the new museums in Africa, they are not in the countries who are the richest or the most powerful. They're in the countries where there is the most democracy and where people feel democracy is, uh, is uh, really uh, existing. Because in democracy, you have a chance for your children. So you think the future will be better than the past. So there you go to school and you bring your children to the museum and the children come. So that's exactly how we built our museum and that's exactly yeah it's it's for the future for the children so when they arrive we don't give them history lessons but through the artist we try to define where we come from and who we are i want to uh, build on, on on this issue of identity because it's really central to the work we're doing with true africa university and quite frankly it's central to all the work i've done throughout my entire career whether it's with trace or true africa the media platform and what we're doing now and i want to really kind of um double on the issue of colonialism because there's a question from kadi sila which came in and i want to get to that first before we get to the other questions she's talking about the multi-faceted impacts of erasure inherent in colonialism and slavery leave one speechless. So I don't really want to get into a debate about, oh, how slavery was so bad and colonialism was, was, was so bad. But I want to talk about it from a very personal perspective, because, you know, um, me growing up in Lomé with this name, this Christian French name that, that you mentioned, Claude, you know, and having um, a lot of light skinned people in my family, I felt the uh, weight of colonialism and, and even colorism, because say my sister, who's very, very light skinned, who would be as light skinned as you are almost, she was, I was always hearing when we were kids how beautiful she is and how ugly I was because I was more dark skinned. And that stratification that is clearly the result of colonialism is something that exists even today with skin whitening and so on. So in terms of the image that you uh, project and that you facilitate through the museum and how people should feel proud of their blackness of their creativity as Africans, how do you specifically educate these young children uh, about, you know, how, what role they could play in this world and, and to be proud of their African heritage? And you said your own kids have names like Ayodele and so on. So I'd love to, you know, to share that with our audience here. I've discussed it with a few people at MIT, but they don't really know the subtleties of what happens in our African society. So I'd love for you to maybe share a little bit more about the educational aspect with the kids yeah it's it's not our place to say um anything about the subjects our place is to describe the work of the artist and um, the way he speaks about the society and about what's happening in the world and that's how the collection has been built the collection has been built around um the idea of a photography of a continent um, if somebody must look at the continent and at what happened in the art world uh, in Western Africa and in Africa uh, at the beginning of the 21st century, uh, our collection should give him this image. So our collection is not um, uh, blinding any subject. Um, and it, of course, we speak um, with the children. When we show Romuald Azoumé, uh, we speak about every kind of slavery. We speak about the slavery that we all know, uh, the historic uh, slave trade. We speak about, um, you know, I, I should have put an image, sorry, um, uh, but he used those uh, gas, those um, uh, oil. Uh, can you? Can I'll, you I'll put it. I'll put it. I'll put it in the chat. So, um, okay, great. Um, yeah, yeah, for people to see exactly those masks uh, with the oil cans and. It also speaks about what's happening today with the people do the traffic of the, the oil between Nigeria and Benin and the actual uh, the actual modern slavery with the children working uh, there. And so the museum is here to show his work and to explain what's happening now, what has been happening uh, before and trying to 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 tell them about it. I don't know how to explain because it's not something we, it's really something we do through the artist. Uh, we speak about the gender questions through Zanele Mwoli, um, uh, through the work of Aisha Smusi. We speak, 
we speak about all the questions uh, through the artist's work. Um, the yes, best thing is maybe to look on our website and uh, and see the exhibition we've done. We also speak about poetry and emotion with Joel Andriano, Marie Soa, and we speak about kind of every aspect. Um, we are quite proud, we are going forward, but we also come with a luggage and, uh, and we're trying to define what's in that luggage because we are not going to play the history again. Um, we have in Benin, we have to fight uh, against a few populists, um, uh, people who want to, to play the colonization war again. And we're not here for that. We're here to say, okay, we come from this world and we come from those civiliz sorry, civilization. Um, people have left for, the, for Brazil, for Haiti, for the United States. Uh, people have become French, uh, some people haven't. Uh, and today, who are we? And where are we going to? And that is really through the collection we're trying to, to show that to, to the young people. I want to um, talk a little bit more about the issue that you brought up of restitution, which is a very important issue, and you've been very uh, um, involved in, in, in uh, many of the efforts that are related to President Macron and a lot of the other African heads of state. And there's a question here from Marie Van Pist, which is, uh, she says, great webinar, Benin is close to my heart. How can foundations like yours influence European policies in driving more restitution uh, on the continent. And uh, she's mentioning specifically the Democratic Republic of Congo, but this could apply to Benin or other countries as well, obviously. Well, restitution is a fascinating subject because we are not really fighting for the past. We are fighting for those objects. We're just the memory of who we are, uh, how great were our kingdoms. So that's why it's so important for the objects to come back. Actually, um, every country has a different story uh, about restitution. Benin has just made an exceptional example. Uh, we got our 26 objects back. And when the people from the French Museum, the Musée du Quai Branly, who have given the, um, uh, the objects uh, back came, they took a lesson of museography. I mean, they arrived and they saw what is the most magnificent way to show this work, um, which is really important because Benin was the first big restitution. And so uh, what has been done through those images is so important because it gives a real chance for the other countries uh, to get their heritage back. Um, because everyone has been saying the objects are going to be uh, in terrible conditions, you're not going to protect them. And, all the racist comments you can find on the internet if you're <laughs> interested in those questions. But the good thing is that the objects came back and the exhibition is just fabulous. And people are coming and they are so moved. It's one of the most intense um, experience to go and see those objects that we've seen a thousand times in, uh, in Paris, to see them in Benin and um, seeing how people uh, are, some of them are crying in front of them and how people are so ecstatic that they came back. So that will influence the next restitution because people just saw with their eyes. It's not just uh, talks and, uh, and the comments on Facebook and Twitter. It's the reality of the images that show how people are interested by their heritage and are fascinated by their history, like everyone else in the world. After, it will be a good point for all the other countries who have asked. Then uh, in the case of Congo, it's very interesting because Kinshasa has created not a restitution, but a reconstitution. Reconstitution is Kinshasa deciding to, is they have 40,000 objects in the National Museum of Congo. Um, they are choosing the objects in Belgium, which are unique and they can't show, and they make them come back. But it's reconstitution from Congo. It's not restitution from Belgium. And Belgium has been really intelligent. It's the first time they are so intelligent on the question. They decided that the, that the ownership of the, the objects won't be Belgium anymore. It will be Congolese. So they might keep them, but they will keep them for Congo. It's not Belgian objects in Belgium. Now it will be Congolese objects in Belgium. And if Congo needs the objects, they can take them back. But it's not Belgium choosing the objects like France did with, with Benin. It's Congo deciding which object, objects they need. So 
Congolese uh, objects are going to come back and uh, there are a lot of things going on in Congo. It's, um, it's through France. And it's a bit like the German way of working with, with uh, Nigeria. So there is a lot of things happening now in uh, restitutions. And what is interesting, it's, it's not only um, France and Benin, it's really Europe and the North world uh, with the South world. So it's, much, it's a much larger uh, initiative. Yeah, yeah it's Benin a pretty interesting compromise. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Michael Burgess has a question, which is uh, maybe taking us outside of uh, contemporary art and visual arts. He's um, asking if you have a comment on how many artists are now exploring the discipline of fashion to express and engage with a wider community. So um, yeah, it'd be good to kind of talk about fashion and maybe a little bit later get into music and film as well. Yeah, I put, uh, sorry, I didn't show you my last slide, which was actually about uh, about fashion. Uh, I don't know if it's possible. Could, to... Yeah, could we, yeah, could we, could we see it? The last slide would be great. <laughs> sorry, I didn't use it, but I, I meant to. Uh, so this one is uh, about this photographer, Léon Sagbojelou, uh, but it's not fashion, it's uh, photography. It's Louis Vuitton using Léon Sagbojelou uh, for its uh, campaign, uh, its fashion campaign of menswear uh, 2021. But the next slide, yeah, the next slide is um, about role models and all the all the different cultural um, personalities that will influence, uh, that will show us we can look at us to find models. You know, the importance of role models. We had to look, uh, well, when we were in Benin, we had to look to France to find role models. Now we can uh, look at ourselves. And when you say, uh, let's speak about fashion, um, I had chosen on the sixth uh, Instagram account I shared, I chose Nana Wax, um, Papa Opong, and uh, Tongoro Studio, because I wanted to show um, uh, people who are quite different. Um, Nana Wax and uh, Tongoro Studio, Sarah from Tongoro Studio, they have been to school together and they've created those brands. Uh, Tongoro is maybe looking um, uh, at clients in the United States. Nana Wax is creating one of the biggest uh, fashion group in Western Africa. And Papa Opong is a stylist um, uh, from Ghana uh, who is studying right now in New York and uh, Rihanna has already worn his, uh, his creation. So I thought it was important to show that because those stylists, those, those fashion uh, designers, they're very, very important to us because they open the world uh, more widely. And they create from, uh, from traditional, uh, from traditional uh, fabrics, from traditional um, uh, crafts that we have in Western Africa. And the Papa Opong uh, photo, I took it specifically because it's about, it's a fabric, new fabric and uh, textile is developing with Quinte, which is one of the most uh, traditional uh, fabric in Ghana, and is making it a fashion, uh, fashionable uh, New York uh, textile. And I found it very interesting that he would use such a traditional material to do such a new creation. You should go to his Instagram and um, because it's very, very interesting. And in well, the other, sorry, in the other- no, go, um, go ahead. Yeah, in the other uh, role models, I wanted to show uh, the portrait of Obama by Kende Wiley, because Kende is uh, an artist from Nigeria, and it was so impactful uh, that Obama chose him to, to paint his, his uh, portrait. And, and then after I showed music with uh, Angelique Kidjo and her fifth Gram Grammy Award uh, four, three weeks ago, and Burna Boy, who's one of the most important musicians I could have chosen with Kid. But I wanted to show all those people who were, um, uh, who were making a success from Africa and sp spreading it uh, out, but from, uh, from Africa. They're not becoming someone else and traveling elsewhere. They are making it from their roots and developing it uh, everywhere else. Yeah, this is, um, it's great to have these examples. Last year, we talked about Afrobeats, you know, and, and the, the, you know, how not many Nigerians and, 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 and Africans, mostly from Western Africa, are exporting new kinds of music. We talked a little bit about Nollywood uh, when, we, when we had uh, Taya Selassie on the webinar. So we talked about how that kind of 
uh, African creativity and, and production and the creative industries is being exported. I wanted to, um, to wrap up uh, by asking you to recommend three books that you love and that you would love to share with our audience here on the MIT True Africa University webinar. Um, yeah, the first one I think is a photographer. I didn't mention her, but she was on my uh, Biennale di Venezia um, uh, slide. It's Zanele Muholi. And I wanted to share the first book, which is called Hail the Dark Lioness. And it's a monography um, edited by Aperture, uh, which is a book everyone should have. Uh, her pictures are seen now everywhere. She's been collected by African museums such as ours, but also uh, she's also, I think, in the Tides Mocha and uh, she's entering many African collections and international ones. She had a show in the Tate Modern uh, in London. She, she'd been, she's been shown in France a lot of times. She's been shown in the state. So this is a magnificent book um, uh, showing, uh, showing her, uh, all our pictures uh, from this series. And the second uh, one would be um, about our history and who we are. Uh, it's a book I discovered in Purchase University uh, two years ago uh, called Barracoon uh, from Zora Neale Hurston, uh, which is a book everyone should read because um, it's uh, the story of the last Daomian slave uh, who arrived in the United States. And it's a, a book that taught me so much about Daome, about the kingdom, about how, um, how the slavery worked. And a lot of things I had hidden to myself because I didn't want to face them. And when you read this uh, book, you understand so much more uh, about the slave trade. And the last book, um, it's a book we did uh, with the foundation, our, our 10th anniversary book that you can charge for free on our, on our internet website. Uh, and it's in English. <laughs> and maybe, yeah, like this, you can have an idea of what, has, what it has been, um, what adventure it has been in the, in the first 10 years um, to go and meet uh, all the Beninese person with contemporary creations and uh, with artists and how we met with children. And yeah, it's kind of 10 years of, uh, of good memories. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much, Marie Cecile, for this fascinating talk. We we learned so much. Even I learned a lot. And I wanted to just mention, since you mentioned Zanin Waholi as one of your three books, um, last week I was in Washington, DC at the National Gallery of Art for the opening of the Afro Atlantics exhibition, huge exhibition, and her face and her image is on the poster. So any of the DC people in, on this webinar go to the National Mall and the National Gallery of Art. Marie Cecile, I want to thank you. I want to thank all of our uh, participants today. I couldn't get to all the questions. There were so many of them, but it were fascinating questions for a fascinating talk. And I want to remind you that we'll be back next week for our final webinar for this season. And we're staying in Benin because I will be interviewing the former president of Benin, Thomas Bonina Yayi, and he's going to share with us what lessons he learned as a head of state. So uh, that will build nicely on the work that Marie Cecile has been doing at the intersection of culture and education. And I hope to see you next week, April 21st at 12 p.m. Eastern. Thank you, Marie Cecile. Thanks everybody. Thanks MIT Center for International Studies. Thank you to everybody at True Africa University and the MIT Africa Project.